Greetings, beloved. I am Pastor Keomo Butler. This is Restoration Victory Ministries. Hope everyone is having a great Sunday so far today. Um, you know, today is our final day in this teaching that we're been, we've been dealing with this week, putting on the full armor of God. I'm really excited about today. I'm really about, excited about today's message. And, you know, before we go any farther, let us bow our heads for a moment of prayer. And let us jump right into this word to see what the Holy Spirit had for us today. Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, giving you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We ask that you will be with us today, Holy Father, that it will be all of you and none of me. Lead us and guide us through your Holy Spirit and to all truth according to the word of God. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, like I said, I'm really excited. Everybody just, you know, shake yourself loose. Shake, shake, shake everything off that you got going on this week. Everything that's on your mind, everything that's in your heart, anything that might be blocking you from hearing from the Holy Spirit of God today, because I believe that this message that God is going to deliver us today will be life changing for us if we allow it to. Now, one of the things that has always been something that I've always paid attention to is hearing teachings, hearing messages, being taught the word of God, but not understanding who the men of God were talking to, what was going on at that time, when they were speaking it, so we can get a full understanding of what God was trying to say through his pop, His apostles and his prophets that he used to deliver his word. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, well, first of all, I'm dressed like this today because I want everyone, like I said, just take off everything that you've got going on this week, week but even more than that, take off everything that you think you know. Take off the churchiness, take off the religion, take off the denominationalism, take off everything that you think or thought you may know about the word and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you as he leads me to really get an understanding. Now, I'm not coming against anyone's doctrine or I'm not trying to write any new doc doctrine. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that <clears throat> it's going to be important for us to really, really, really clear our minds so that we can hear from God today on this subject matter. Like I was saying, you know, a lot of times we hear the word preached to us. And if we don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, proper historical understanding, we can't really get the full brunt of what the word was saying to us. We don't get the full impact. A lot of times as Christians, I always say we romanticize the Bible, which means we take the word we read the word, but we don't put the word in proper context. And so it's all fluffy. It's airy. And because of that, believe it or not, beloved, the enemy wins because it, it doesn't allow us to really, really, really. The Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says that you should put line upon line and precept upon precept, which means that we should rightly divide the word it is, as it is written. Not so much according to, in a lot of cases, interpretation or us putting the word in a certain way to fit whatever's going on, whatever message we're teaching, whichever point we're trying to get across, which is good because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. So again, no issues with that, but sometimes if we don't really take the Bible, don't romanticize it, but really understand what's going on, then we can't be victorious. You know, case in point, we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is great. But sometimes we don't put ourselves in the mind frame of the fact that Jesus was actually crucified, nailed to a cross, the pain, the excruciating pain that he went through. Spiritually, that was a greater goal there was a greater spiritual ramification and a greater spiritual victory, yes. But in that day and in that time in history, in real life, the pain that he went through and Jesus being Jesus understood why he was going through it. But the pain, the heartbreak and the suffering that his family, the apostles, the disciples and everything, everyone around him went through watching that happen to our Lord. And if we don't really sometimes take ourselves out of just the victory, but understanding the battle, praise God, the battle, then 
We can't be victorious because we just want the victory. But we don't understand. They went through the battle first. I say all that to say, listen, we've been reading the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. In the 10th verse, I'm starting in the 10th verse, and I'm just going to read through some of it now, not all of it, because I'm as I go through today, and we're not going to be as long as I, I really thought today was going to be a blowout sermon where I was going to teach for an hour. I don't think that's necessary. Like I said, I'm coming in my regular gear because I want everyone, I want you to look at me. I don't want you to look at this as a unrelatable, churchy message. I want you to look at this as a teaching message. So I'm coming as you are. I'm coming normal in my regular gear, not trying to be anybody important, just being a brother and sister, brother, brother in Christ to the brothers and sisters out there in Christ to truly try to get a message across. Full armor of God. The Bible says Ephesians 6 chapter 10 verse, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And put on the full arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. Therefore, put on the full arm of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. Now, listen to the words. Put on the full arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. Stand in the evil day, having done all, stand. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. These are all war words. These aren't romanticized, feel good words. These are war words, like war. Like we have to understand that we are in a spiritual warfare. Now, let's understand who the writer, the Apostle Paul was writing to when he wrote this to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus at that time, just a quick history so we can get a full understanding. We need more of a full understanding than we do, we do need to un understanding the spiritual armor because I've taught on that all week. We have that. But let's get an understanding of who he was writing to and what was going on when he talked about this spiritual armor. This right here is a history lesson. Ephesus was at that time considered the fourth greatest or largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a city full of pagans. The city itself was not a Christian city. It was a city that served all the different gods of that time. The sun god, the moon god, the god of victory, the god of light. There was a different god for everything, but it was a paganistic society. It was a society filled with witchcraft sorcery and all kind of idolatry and anything that was impure, that was the culture of that society way before Christianity. So when Paul came in the first time and he brought the Holy Spirit and the power of God with him and he changed and converted some people to the followers of Jesus Christ, the followers of the way, that didn't become like in the United States of America today, Regardless of what you think about this country, we are and we were a Christian country. One nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We were created as a country under Jesus Christ. They say the old kings and language, the Bible is converted into English. It was done in England. That was brought to the United States of America and the country was established. Not that that. You know, I'm not getting into the history of the country and all that. I'm not. That's not what we're talking about. But this country, Christianity wasn't it's starting to be now, but it wasn't a sin. It was the national religion of our country. So praying, praising, seeing Christianity on TV, going to church, Christian music, regardless of what the person was doing or what they had going on, whether or not there was a good Christian or not, doesn't matter. Christianity was what this country was founded on. Well, in Ephesus, in Ephesia, it was totally different. This was a sinful, idolatry, idealistic, paganistic, witchcraft, voodoo, anything that you can name, a worshiping of everything but the most high God. 
Then on top of that, you had the Jews who really didn't believe that pagans or that the uncircumcised should be saved. You had them. So the, the Christians, the ones that Paul had converted, were not only dealing with the, just the evil of that time, but then they were also dealing with the church trying to change the gospel that Paul had delivered to them. So when Paul wrote this letter back to them, he wasn't writing back to America, to a Christian country. He was writing back to a small church, even more, more so like a cult, a sect, as they were called in the Bible, a sect, a small group of people and a mass of people. And a small group of people in Ephesus which was, like I said, the fourth largest city of the Roman Empire at that time, which was a, a hub for import and export. It, 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 it was a harbor. Excuse my language. I couldn't remember the word. It was a harbor. So everything, all the traffic, because everything at that point was done by the sea, came in and out through Ephesus. It was a evil, idolatry place. Take, it was... Las Vegas times 10,000 without any Christianity, except for a small sect. So when Paul wrote back to them, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and put on the full armor of God, he was starting to put their full armor on because they were about to wrestle against all this other stuff daily. Every day they dealt with it. You had husbands that were believers and followers of the ways that their wife and their children and their in-laws and all those other people and family and friends who were still serving all these different gods, didn't believe, didn't like, didn't understand, ridiculed, made fun of them, ostracized them, in a lot of cases, jailed them, persecuted them. And in this time, being hung and being stoned, that was what they did. So some people were hung, some people were stoned, some people were beaten, people losing family and friends and loved ones, all because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only thing that they had that they could rely on to be victorious was the full armor of God. So when we listen and we read now, when I go through this now, go through an understanding that if they were able to do it, if Paul wrote this to them, then it, we should be able to do it now. Because guess what, beloved? It kind of relates to us now. More and more, this country is moving away from Christianity. More and more, this world is moving away from Christianity. More and more, you got the gods, you got the sun, moons, and people worshiping stars and worshiping the universe. And, you know, I even see Christians say stuff like, I put it out in the universe and the universe return it to me. They don't even realize that deep, that, that is idolatry. You don't put it out in the universe. You speak it to God the Father who controls the universe. Or if you say, I'm speaking in the universe, I'm speaking in the universe in the name of Jesus Christ, because the name of Jesus Christ is the name that is above every name, those in heaven, those on earth, and those below the earth. We don't see that. We got our music, we got television, we got same-sex stuff going on, we got all this different stuff that's really so contrary to the word and it's attacking the word and we don't understand it and it's attacking us as Christians and because we don't have our full armor on and in a lot of cases because we don't even expect to have the battle because we romanticize the Bible so much that we don't look at it for face value for what it is. I am convinced that some of the true first Christians, the followers of the way, those that follow Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christos, will probably look at us and call us soft Christians. Excuse my language, but, you know, they will call us weak Christians. Y'all are weak because of the stuff that we allowed that they wouldn't allow because they had to, they understood it from a different place because they saw it in their face. You know, the devil right now is not as much, it wasn't as much in your face, say, 50 to 100 years ago as it is now. Now it's becoming more in your face. And this is why we have to be girded up in this word and in the armor of God. I could talk about that all day, but I'm going to get off my soapbox on that. Just understand. This warfare is weird, real. And we have to approach it as such.
with our full armor of God. I really can just stop there and go. Because the reality of it is we have to, we have to approach, praise God. We have to approach this full armor of God and our desire and our passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we have to approach if someone would disrespect our mother or our husband or our wives or our kids or our father. You know, that same righteous indignation, that same passion, that same fire that we would have in that situation. We have to have that towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. But just with, with <laughs> because me, I, I'm, I have to preface this because I know people who know me looking at that saying, huh? I know you're not saying that, Kiyomo. Because I, I used to be a little rough. A little temperamental. But with the wisdom of God now. With the wisdom of God. But with the same understanding that this is a warfare. The, the Bible says that no man when he lists himself in the army, concerns himself with the affairs of this world, that he may please him who enlisted him to be a soldier. And no man, when he competes with, for masteries, can be crowned unless he competes according to the rule. The hardworking former must be the first to partake of the crop. What does that mean? It means that first, if you have enlisted yourself in the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're on team Jesus, if you're sold out for Jesus, then you can't worry about nothing the world is saying. See, once you do that, once you put on your full armor, the world matters and what they're saying and what they're doing matters nothing to you. Because you worry about pleasing Jesus who enlisted you to be in his army. You're in the army of the Lord. You can't, they say compete for masteries, but in other interpretations of the Bible, it says no man, when he competes in a sport, can win, can get the crown unless he competes according to the rules of that sport, which means you can't play football according to basketball rules. Basketball according to baseball rules. If you're going to play football, you need to play football according to football rules in order to get the prize of football. So if you're going to be a Christian, then you have to, and you're going to put on your warfare and your armor, then you have to do it according to the word, according to be, in order to be victorious. And I'm twisting up all of my words, man, because I'm so excited about this. Because listen, I can tell you prophetically that this is happening to some of you, because I can tell you internally, experimentally, experientially, experiment, experiment, <laughs> through my experiences, that this has happened to me. I've wanted to play and be on, on Jesus' team, be on team Jesus, but I wanted to do it according to my own rules. Or I wanted to do it not knowing and not understanding what Paul really meant, who he was writing to, and what was going on at that time in order to be victorious. Now, I don't know exactly which verse, so let me tell you. It says in verse 13, it says, therefore, you know, verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, principalities, powers. But then in verse 13, it says, this is what it tells you to do. It says, therefore, gird your waist about with truth. Gird your loins with truth. Now, I'm going to say gird your loins with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, and putting on the helmet of salvation, it's all the same thing. It all goes, see what the apostle Paul was doing there because he wanted to have a full armor because he wanted to tell them again in that time because that is when they had gladiators. That's when they would enter in coliseums and fight. That's when Roman soldiers would wear their armor. So that's what they understood. So he was breaking it down so that you can understand that each part of your body is covered. But in reality, gird your loins up with truth the breastplate of righteousness, at least part of it, and the helmet of salvation, it's all the same thing. What is the truth? Again, Paul writing to a paganistic society, an ungodly society, an evil society, a society that did not believe in, did not have any, did not want to have anything to do with, and at every point tried to challenge the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus wasn't real to them, just as they're trying to do now. Praise God. Just as everything and everyone is trying to water down, they try to water down, water down Jesus in politics. They try to water him down in, even in religion. They try to water him down in some cases in the military. They try to water him down in schools. They try to water him down in society. Everything and everybody is trying to water Jesus down or take him out completely. Again, this is perfect. What is the truth? 
The truth is, the Most High God rules in the kingdom of heaven and earth. The truth is, there's one body, there's one spirit, there's one God, there's one Father who is above all, over all, through all, and in you all. There's one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I messed that scripture up. I'm going to say it again. There's one body and there's one spirit, just as you are called, and one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, and there's one God, the Father, who is above all, over all, in all, and through you all. There's one. There's one mediator between man and God, the man, Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein in the gospel of Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God revealed from heaven from faith to faith, for the just shall live by their faith. So the most high God rules in the kingdom of heaven and earth. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. And I am not ashamed of that gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And only the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have in you, which you have from God, for you are not your own. You were bought with the price, so glorify God with your whole body and your whole spirit, which belongs to him. For I have the mind of Christ Jesus. That's the truth and nothing else. Nothing else. Like, no, if, if, it, if, that, if it doesn't line up with that, if it doesn't have something to do with that, if it's Jesus, but if it's God, but if it's the gods, the universes, oh, there's more than one way to God. We all serve our own God. We all, our all, we all our, have our own way to get to our higher power. Any of that, that's not of Christianity, beloved. That's not of Christianity. That is not shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That is not the gospel of peace. See, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of peace. Peace, shalom. When Again, when Paul wrote this to the Christians at that time, some of them was Jews, some of them was circumcised, some of them was uncircumcised. I mean, some of them was Hebrews and Jews who had moved to that area, and some of them were born into that Roman Empire. But they understood shalom. Shalom is peace. All is good. All is well. Complete inner peace, complete outer peace. Freedom from agitation, worry, stress, problems, troubles. Nothing is missing. Nothing is broken in your life. John 10 and 10. The thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you should have life and life more abundantly. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of peace. I've been made put on the breastplate of righteousness. I have been made the righteousness of God. I am in right standing with God. I am an heir of God and I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ through the righteousness of God that has been placed upon me. My sins and my iniquities will not be inputted unto me anymore through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through me doing it the way the word says to do it, through me living in the righteousness of God. I have been saved. I have been redeemed. I have been delivered. I have been set free. The ransom for me has been paid. There's no more handwriting on the wall against me. I am in right standing with God. I am saved from Satan and from his situation, from his power, from his authority. There's nothing he can do to me because I have been rescued. I have been delivered. I have salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the gospel of peace, as I said, being made the righteousness of God, put it on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. It all goes the same. It's all the same thing, just broken up. What, what Paul did was he broke it down many different ways to try to make it make sense to everyone. If you didn't get it this way, maybe you can understand it this way based upon the cultures of that time. But the reality of it is it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Power of God unto salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the gospel of Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God, the breastplate revealed from heaven, from faith to faith, for the just shall so live by their faith. That one scripture covers all three. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of peace, power of God unto salvation, righteousness of God, from faith to faith, for the just shall live by their faith. So you've put on your 
your truth. You understand that there's one God. I don't care what nobody says. There's one God. There's one Jesus. There's one way to God. That's the truth. And I have that Holy Spirit. The one way to God is through Jesus. And the one way to Jesus is through the Holy Spirit. And I have that on the inside of me. Period. Period. Like my mom used to say, period or period. That's it. Then I shot my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shalom. Life and life more abundantly. Victory. Complete peace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Power of God unto salvation, which I have on my head. The helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So like I said, they all go, you can't really have one without the other. You can't have the gospel of peace without knowing that you're the righteousness of God without having the salvation. So you're walking in peace. You have the righteousness of God covering your chest because you know that you're the righteousness of God and you have on the helmet of salvation. Mentally, in your mind and in your brain, you know that you are saved. Why is it in different places? Well, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Right? Then the Bible says, what after this? Uh, gird your waist up with truth, but breastplate of righteousness. You, the breastplate of righteousness, you know in your heart you are righteous. You know that you are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then the Bible says, so once you know that you're righteous and you know that you have peace, then the Bible says, be holy for I am holy. So you have to be holy. The Bible says, be holy in all your manner of conduct for it is written, be holy for I am holy. So you have to be holy. You have to be righteous. You have to walk righteous. You have to yearn for righteousness. You have to want righteousness. Because if you don't want righteousness, as I'll, when I finish, as I'll explain, if you don't have all these right. If you don't have your armor completely intact, then you give the devil a leeway. But you have to be righteous. You have to be holy. For I am holy. Be, that, that is so important. The Bible says that you were created after God in righteousness and in true holiness. So you were created after God in righteousness and in true holiness. So not only are you the righteousness of God, but you were created after God in righteousness and true holiness through the Holy Spirit of God that you have in you. Fruits of the Spirit of law, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against those there is no law. So if you have those in you, if you have the mind of Christ Jesus, if you know that you were created after God in righteousness and true holiness, and you have that in your heart, your breastplate of righteousness, then the devil can't beat you there. So you, you gird it up with truth. He can't beat you there. You're walking in peace. You know you have the gospel of peace. He can't beat you there. You have the breastplate of righteousness on. You know that he can't beat you there. Then he says, guess what? Take the shield of faith by which you will quench all the darts of the wicked one. Above all. Again, I'm real simple. I use this one scripture because it just clears everything up. The Bible says faith the Bible says faith without works is dead. So putting on this full arm of God is putting on, showing that you have faith. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed from heaven from faith to faith, for the just shall live by their faith. But well, what are you living by your faith in? You're living, living by your faith in, I have put on, gird my lungs up with truth. I have the breastplate of righteousness. I've shot my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I know this. So I know the truth. I know and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. I even understand and know salvation. Because see, another thing is, even though this is put in order, there's really no order because you can't have anything without the word. Which is really the last thing that they mention. You have to have faith in the word. It's through the word that we find out about Jesus. And it's in, and through the word that we as Christians live. But you got to have your faith. So if you have faith, again, I'm, real quick. When you have your faith, Christians, we go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. The just shall live by their faith. Then the helmet of salvation, we just, we spoke about that. 
Then the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. We talked about this the other day. I'm going to talk about it again. And as I close with this, Jesus had all power and all authority. Jesus came to this earth doing great and supernatural miracles. But even Jesus used the sword of the spirit, the word of God to defeat the devil. Now, in the time that they were living in, in Ephesus, and the time we're living in now, the only thing that we as Christians have is the word of God. And we use the word of God. We will the word of God. It's our sword to be victorious against the enemy. When the enemy attacks you, you use your faith to shield it. And your faith in what? See, this is your faith. This is the first thing the fiery darts of the wicked one to come at. But what is your faith in? Your faith is that you know the truth. The, way, the faith is that you know you're saved. You have on the breastplate of righteousness and you're walking in the gospel of peace. So your faith in the fact that you have on your full armor, the enemy can't do anything to you. Then you use this word, the sword of the spirit, to fight back. To fight back. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God will be perfect and thoroughly equipped unto every good work. No scripture is given by any private interpretation of man, but holy men of God spoke in the past as they were told by God. Prophets received from God, and then they spoke it. This doesn't come from man. The Bible says the word of God is quick and is powerful and is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing to the divine and asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joint and the marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Sharper than a two-edged sword. I can close it right there. Sharper than a two-edged sword. So now let's look at this. Just real, 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 real quick. Let's, let's end here. Because we have to understand this. We're in a warfare. I can tell you personally that if you're not completely girded up in your armor, the enemy will destroy you. The enemy tried to destroy and he did Adam. For those of us who don't know, if you go back and look at the story of Noah, the enemy tried to destroy Noah. You know, again, we read the Bible, we romanticize it, but we don't look at, praise God, please listen to this. Please listen to this. Let me make this make sense to you. One minute. That's all it's going to take me. Me. Are you? Hey, God comes to you in a vision. Because this is what happened to Noah. God came to him in a vision, in a dream, and said to him, hey, man, I'm, I'm speaking in our terms. Hey, man, listen, son, I'm going to send some rain to this earth. I know you've never seen rain. I need you to build a boat. I need you to build it exactly to these measurements and these specifications that I've given you. And... When you when you finish building it, I'm going to send you two of each animal. And then I'm going to send rain on the earth and wipe out all civilization. And only you and these animals are going to survive. Now, you've never seen rain. You don't know where the boat is. But I just need you to believe. Just trust and believe. That's the faith. That's the faith part of it. That's hearing from God, the word of God, knowing what God's saying, knowing what God's word said, and then operating in it. Now, when the battle comes, when you need your full armor, when Noah needs his full armor was when everyone around him starts seeing him cutting down trees and building stuff and putting stuff together and taking leaves and branches and fastening a boat. And everyone looking at it like, what is Noah doing? In the beginning, they ridiculed him. But then as they saw Noah was more and more serious and they start trying to figure out what was going on. And then, you know, you got other demons and other prop, uh, people getting what they consider prophetic utterances from demons and demonic sources and all that that are fighting against Noah that are now trying to start to challenge Noah because they know that Noah is doing the will of God. So now all these evil people are coming at Noah while Noah is steadfast to follow the word. And Noah had to go through all the turmoil. Noah had to go through a wife who really didn't understand, but she had to follow because he was following God. He had to go through kids, grown adults, who had families, who really didn't understand, but they had to follow because he was following God. But these were still human beings with their own thoughts, emotions, and attitudes. And Noah had to be strong in that and follow the word of God, the word of God, in order to be victorious. He had on the full armor of God. We, today, Jesus, when he was tempted by the enemy in the garden, 
when he was in his weakest state. Listen how slick the enemy is. He came to Jesus when he was in his weakest physical state, having fasted, no food. So, you know, again, we romanticize everything. Now, Jesus was a human and people have done it over history. Some people have hurt themselves over history trying to do it when the Lord didn't tell them to do it. But people have done it. He had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine how weak, how physically exhausted he was? But yet the enemy came into him in his weakest state trying to get him to go against God. But he had on his full armor. He knew who he was. He knew the truth. He knew that he was walking in the peace of God. He knew that he had salvation. He knew that he was the righteousness of God. He had his bold faith. He had his shield. And then he fought back with his sword, which is the word. We, and this is the point that I want to say as I close. Your, the Bible says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all stand. The Bible says that in the book of James, you believe God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. They were talking about faith without works. The faith is, okay, you believe in God. The works is you have to put on the full armor of God and you have to be sober and vigilant for your adversary. The devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. If you don't have the full armor of God on, if you haven't accepted the full armor of God, if you haven't decided within your heart and with your soul and within your spirit that you're going to walk according to the word of God, as a man thinketh in, and remember we spoke about this the other day, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of your heart flows the issues of your life. How can you be in evil speak good things for how the abundance of the heart, the mind speaks? The mouth speaks, I'm sorry. <laughs> out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you don't have your heart and if you're ever convinced on the inside that this gospel, that this full armor that you have to put on and that you have to be sober and be vigilant about, you have to draw near unto God, resist the devil, and then he will flee. See, Jesus was drawn near to God when the devil came into him in the wilderness, in the garden, you know, depending upon which version of the Bible you read. But when the devil tried to tempt him, he resisted the devil. The devil had to flee. But then the Bible says that the devil went away until a more opportune time, which means the devil didn't go away for good. He went till he could come back. Remember the, the parable that we spoke about the other day. When a demon is cast out of a man, the man tries to come back. The demon finds a man house clean, swept, and in order because the man is full of the Holy Spirit. So he goes out and gets seven demons worse than itself, and they come back. And they enter in the man in the worst end. The latter end of the man is worse than the beginning because his armor wasn't there. If you don't, you can have, all, this whole armor has to be together. You can't say that you have salvation, but you don't want to be righteous. You can't say you're righteous, but you don't want to walk in peace. You can't say you want to walk in peace, but you don't believe the truth. You can't say you got the truth, but you don't have your shield. You don't really believe all this word. And you can't fight with the word if you don't believe all this word. You can't believe in Jesus if you don't accept the word. You can't love the Lord if you don't believe and accept the Holy Spirit. And it goes on and on and on. It's just a circle. It's just continual. Any part of this, because again, this is not about going to heaven. Humbly, to all those out there that grew up in the church, you're Christians, you believe, you went to church all your life, your grandma, your mama, grandpa, your daddy, your uncle, your aunts, everybody's in the church. You grew up in the church. But now you don't really believe. Some of the stuff you just don't believe. Some of the stuff you just can't accept. It just don't make sense. You just don't like it. It just don't feel good to you in your flesh. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Because there's a that there, there Jesus said in the word when he was in one of his parables, he said, in the end, there are going to be many that are going to come unto me and say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast our demons in your name? Have we not in your name done many great works? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice iniquity. I'm going to say, Jesus is going to say, depart. You who didn't believe my word. You who chose not to put on this full armor. And when you don't put on the full armor, listen, marriage is not easy. Relationships aren't easy. Working at certain jobs with certain people aren't easy. Friendships aren't easy. 
having kids that are unruly aren't easy, easy. being in and around abusive situations aren't easy. If you someone that had a history of drugs, alcohol, abuse, whatever in your system, it's not easy. You know, being a natural liar, a natural manipulator is not easy. Being money hungry, being a gold digger, being a man that's a manipulator for money is not easy. Being so concerned about you and your family, your family only, and money and finances, and that's all that matters to you, it's not easy. And we can, all those, all those things that I just said, we can be all those things and still be in the church. See, that's the part that I need us to understand. In the days when Paul wrote this to Ephesus, if you were any one of those things that I just named, the people of Ephesia were going to tear your butt apart. They were going to break your armor down because you had too many holes in your armor. You had too many kinks. There was too much air getting in. It's too much light. The wrong kind of light getting into your armor. You weren't protected. And all it takes is a little, 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 little bitty, bitty, bitty hole. And you keep jabbing at that hole. You keep jabbing at that hole. You keep jabbing at that hole. And before long, you'd be amazed at how big that hole is. It's the same thing with this today. We can be in the church, but if we're not committed to this full armor of God, then the enemy will come in to kill, steal, and destroy. He will come in seeking whom he may destroy. He walks around like a roaring lion. Your adversary, you're not wrestling against people, but principalities, powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness, uh, rules of darkness in this age, people trying to put voodoo on you, cast spells on you, speaking evil on you, devils that are coming in trying to make you think that you're winning. You're winning because you got money. You're winning because you got good credit. You got a good job, but you're hateful. You're unforgiving. You have no love in your heart. Well, you're not walking in the fruits of the spirit. You're not walking in the gospel of peace. You're not walking according to the word. And the devil will destroy you then. Beloved, again, if you believe in born again, this is not a believed in born again thing. If you say you love Jesus and you know in your heart you love Jesus, but you refuse to put on your full armor, you're going to go and you're going to be before God in the judgment. And, and as he said, he will say to some, depart from me. I never knew you. You don't want to be there. Judgment is, a, a, you know, again, we romanticize the Bible, but judgment is a serious thing. We have to put on our full armor of God so that we can be victorious on this earth and we know that we'll be victorious in everlasting life. Again, beloved, it's not easy. I am dealing with it daily. I can speak to you so passionately because this is something that I keep myself and bring myself under subjection on a daily basis. I have to be sober and, and vigilant on a daily basis. I pray to God and I ask God and I constantly seek to work within myself to be delivered, to make sure that I have my armor on the way the Lord has desired for me to have my armor on so that I can be victorious. God does not need any of us to rewrite his word for him. This book has been the best-selling book since it was written. Since taking a survey or keeping count of which books are the best-selling books since that started. This book has been the best-selling book in history for a reason. Got to put on our full armor because this is about winning. Any This is about winning. See, now I'm going to get a little happy now. I don't want it to be so doom and gloom. This is more teaching that we can understand. So when things happen to you, it if, if something happens to you that is no fault of your own, you can go to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, help me to understand because I'm walking in your love and I am being obedient. But if something happens to you that's a result of something you've done, then you have to be introspective and say, hey, man, what am I doing? Like what part of my full armor is not right in this area that this is happening to me? The Bible says a curse without cause or not a lie. So no one can curse you or do anything to you or bring anything on you as long as you're in this word and you're praying and you're trusting and you're believing. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. That's what we need to do. The Bible says, speak to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving thanks unto God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. 
Ask God to help you to strengthen your armor so that you can be victorious. I thank you. This ends this series. I hope everyone had a great week. I hope everyone learned something this week. I know I did. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit, for the way he allows me to minister and for ministering to me as I have a chance to minister to you. We praise God. <clears throat> we praise God for his glory. We thank him for his glory. And in Jesus name, we say bye bye and thank you, Father God. Amen.